God bless you. We are going to begin with our systematic Bible study in chapter 17 of the second book of Samuel. We will continue with our weekly Bible study. Today we are going to see the advice of Ahitophel and the advice of Hushai. And we're going to see the scripture. We begin in verse 1. Moreover, Ahitophel said to Absalom, Now let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and weak, and make him afraid. And all the people who are with him will flee, and I will strike only the king. Let's look at what is being presented to us, the scene, the image that Ahitophel is giving to Absalom. He is giving him the image of a tired, a weak and weary David who is in anguish. This was a time where the emotions of David were afloat and emotionally and physically he was worn out. And this was the opportune time, according to the advice of Ahitophel, which was a right-on advice. It was the right time to attack him. And so Ahitophel asks for 12,000 men to lead this battle. The idea is brilliant. It is a good strategy with one problem. Ahitophel was a man full of pride, just like Absalom. And he was a manipulator. And he knew, certainly, that he would accomplish his objective. Ahitophel mentions David as the king. In the deep of his heart, he knew that David was still the king. And just like Absalom, he knew that truth. Absalom knew that he was not the king. For that reason, he wanted to kill his father, to occupy the position of his father. This seemed good to Absalom. The advice seemed good to him, very good. And in verse 3 he says, Then I will bring back all the people to you, when all return except the man whom you seek. All the people will be at peace. Look at the advice, and this, beloved in Christ, this assimilates, uh, there's a parallel here. We can see Christ here, and I'm going to take you, if you will allow me to, take you to the Gospel of John, chapter 11, and we're going to see in verse 49, John 11, 49, it says, And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for, that, for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. And it says here in verse 53, Then from that day on they plotted to put him to death. And so we see here that the Lord's ministry was about to end, and in chapter 11, the resurrection of Lazarus was going to take place. And Jesus had anywhere between three to five days of life left. And this is where Caiaphas and all of the Sanhedrin, they agree, they agreed to kill him, to kill the Lord Jesus. And here we see how Ahitophel, all we need to do is kill one man, Ahitophel said. You don't need, he told Absalom, we don't need to kill your father's men. We just, You just need one man to die. And that man was King David. According to Ahitophel's plans and according to the plans of Caiaphas, the high priest in the times of Jesus. And it was one man alone that they wanted to end so that the whole nation wouldn't die. And so we can see how in the times 
they reveal to us, uh, the whole word reveals to us the life of Christ. And it's beautiful when we find Christ in the Bible. In every passage that we read, we are going to find an image of the Lord Jesus. And here we see David from whom the Lord Jesus was going to come from his lineage. Kill one man only so there will be peace. And that's exactly what happened with the Lord Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Through the death of the Lord Jesus, of his sacrifice, and of uh, recognizing salvation through Christ, we can find peace. And so here is this on point advice. And uh, we see that Hushai is uh, already a part of the counselors or advisors of Absalom because David sent him so that he would turn, that he would frustrate the advice that Ahitophel gave. And so Hushai knows that Ahitophel's advice is correct. And so his assignment from the king was to declare the contrary, to frustrate that plan. And so last week we saw how useful, faithful people are in the congregation because the advice of the enemy is wise, but it is diabolical. The ones who are sent from the Lord to destroy those works of the devil, they do it in the wisdom of God. And so we see that Hushai's job was to declare the contrary to destroy the advice of Ahitophel. And Hushai sells to Absalom an image very contrary to the one that Ahitophel is selling to Absalom. So Hushai sells the image of the David of the past. And this advice seemed good in verse 4. So we go to Second Samuel 17, verse 4. And we see an answered prayer. And so God is answering his prayer because Absalom liked the advice of Ahitophel. So in verse 5, he said, Then Absalom said, Now call Hushai the archite also, and let us hear what he says too. In verse 6, And when Hushai came to Absalom, Absalom spoke to him, saying, Ahitophel has spoken in this manner. Shall we do as he says? If not, speak up. So Hushai said to Absalom, The advice that Ahitophel is given is not good at this time. For said Hushai, You know your father. So look at the image that Hushai is going to sell to Absalom. You know your father and his men, that they are mighty men, and they are enraged in their minds, like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. And your father is a man of war and will not camp with the people. Surely by now he is hidden in some pit or in some other place. And it will be when some of them are overthrown at the first that whoever hears it will say there is a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom and even who he is who is valiant, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will melt completely. For all Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, and those who are with him are valiant men. Your father and his men are valiant men. Okay, Absalom? Ahitophel's advice doesn't look that good. It's not advisable for him to go alone with 12,000 men to finish David off because David is weakened. No, David is not weakened. He is a man of war. And the men who are with him are valiant men as well. And it's true, yes, they're in bitterness of spirit, but they're dangerous, like a bear without her cubs. So imagine how his state of mind is. He's furious. As it is, they're valiant men, men of war, and now that they're in this bitterness of spirit, as a bear, when they take her cub, they're going to be terrible. And he says, he's a man of war, and he's not going to be, spend the night with the people. He's going to be hidden in some cave. You're going to go looking for David. You're not going to find him. 
He's going to be at some other place. And when they hear that one of your men have fallen, and remember, your father is a man of war. He is a valiant man. So look at what Hushai is advising to Absalom. Don't trust. He's not weak. He is not defeated. He is not in anguish. He is not devastated. He is not the weak David that Hushai is showing. So he's a valiant man. His men are valiant men. And so look at the image of David. The dangerous David is what Hushai sold to Absalom. And he advised him that he shouldn't be attacked rapidly. Now, why did he do it? Ahitophel says, this night I'm going to go and finish David off. But Hushai knows that he needs time to go and let the priests know that David came back to Jerusalem so that they can inform him what was happening inside of Jerusalem. And so the priests need time to send messengers to look for David, to go meet up with David and give him the information of the plan that Ahitophel had. So with this, Hushai is showing that, it, hey, it's not going to be easy. They have to prepare. So he brings the image of David of the past. The one. Now the fact that Hushai gave advice was an answered prayer for David. David sent him to, to give the contrary advice, remember. And so now Hushai had to come up with a fast solution. And so now Hushai gives the following advice. He said, gather yourself a numerous army. And it says in verse 11, and this is the advice that Hushai Gave. Therefore, I advise that all Israel be fully gathered to you from Dan to Beersheba, like the sand that is by the sea for the multitude, and that you go to battle in person. Look, Absalom, Ahitophel wants to go by himself with 12,000 men, but it's not the time. Let's prepare ourselves right, because David is strong, David is a warrior, and his men are warrior men. So let's do another plan. What do you think? Why don't you gather all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba, like the sand that is by the sea for the multitude, and that you go to battle in person? And so, this is interesting. Now look at the picture. Look at what Hushai is presenting to Absalom. Absalom is going to begin to visualize his mighty army prepared, a multitude like the sands of the sea. He is showing him greatness. That is what he is showing him. What is Hushai doing here? He is appealing to the pride of Absalom. What was the spiritual problem that Absalom had? What was the character, the personality of Absalom? What was the sin of Absalom? It was pride. And so what Hushai is doing is a, he's appealing to the pride in Absalom. Oh, look, your army is going to look numerous. So numerous as the sand of the, of the sea. And we will fall upon them in some place where he may be found. We will fall on him as the dew falls on the ground. So Absalom is visualizing the grandi the grandness of his powerful of his power looking at himself majesty showing his military power in front of a david whom you want to take who is not the weak one that ahitophel said Hushai presents David, the strong one. And he says, but you're going to go with that strong army. So Absalom visualized 
his power, the greatness of his army, and him heading it all. An honorable parade of a show of power. But Hushai needed the time to give the information to David so that they can cross the Jordan safely with all of his people. God was preparing the disaster of Absalom. The advice of Ahitophel was rejected and the one of Hushai was accepted. The advice of Hushai appealed to the vanity and the pride in Absalom. And here we can see the mercy of God towards David. Though he was being disciplined, the mercy of God never separates from us in the midst of the discipline. God was protecting David, though he was being corrected. The word discipline is a synonym with discipleship. In other words, correction to bring formation. Nowadays, correction is not liked. In other words, the discipline. In other words, the discipleship. People don't like it. But without that discipline, without that discipleship, without the correction, there is no formation. There will be no formation. Because God is doing in us a transformational work. He is transforming us. Our life is affected by sin. Our soul is distorted. Our emotions are distorted. Our whole being is distorted because of sin. The vision that we have, us humanly, is is blinded. We cannot see the spiritual things. We need to be transformed. But in order to be transformed, we need a discipleship. A discipleship is required. Discipline is required. Correction is required to correct the damage that sin has done to our hearts, to our soul, to our life. So therefore, we see the mercy of God. David is being corrected. Yes, he's being disciplined, corrected. Yes, God is using his rod. Yes, but inside of all of that discipline, all of that correction, we can see that God is always going to be with us. His mercy is always going to accompany us. David is warned of the plan of Absalom. Look at verse 15, and it says, Then Hushai said to Zadok and Abiathar, the priest, Thus and so Ahitophel advised Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and so I have advised. 16. Now therefore send quickly and tell David, saying, Do not spend this night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily cross over, lest the king and all the people who are with him be swallowed up. Hushai won the time that he needs, that David needs, to be able to cross the Jordan and that the people would not be destroyed with him. Why? Because Absalom liked the advice of Hushai, and so he was going to prepare all of his army, and that was to take time. But this time was sufficient time so that David and his people would cross the Jordan safely. And so now we're going to find, and it seems that I'm going to go out of the theme, but I'm not because this is in, in the context. And it says in verse 17, Now Jonathan and Ahimaaz stayed at Enrogel, for they dared not be seen coming into the city. So a female servant would come and tell them, and they would go and tell King David. Nevertheless, so we'll stop there. So they sent a female servant to give the message. Why? Because David is going to go in front of the army and as he prepares the army so these two took this opportune time to take the message to David and we see the intervention of a servant of a woman 
And I'm not going to take the time to speak about the ministry of the woman because through the word, we can see more about the ministry of the woman and of the men as well. And so we're going to see this woman and we're going to see what her ministry was. She went to go give a message of salvation because if they did not receive that message, David would have not hurried to cross the River Jordan. A woman in the plan of redemption of God. Why do I say this? Because David would become the ancestor of the Lord Jesus from the descendancy of David came the Lord Jesus. Now, we're going to see the intervention of another woman in verse 19. Then the woman took and spread a covering over the well's mouth and spread ground grain on it, and the thing was not known. When Jonathan and Ahimaaz take the message and they give it to this woman, it, it says in verse 18, they were seen. It says, nevertheless, a lad saw them and told Absalom. But both of them went away quickly and came to a man's house in Bahurim who had well in his court, and they went down into it. So then the woman of this house, and she was the wife of this man, she spread a covering over the well's mouth and spread ground grain on it, and the thing was not known. Nothing was known. And when Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house, they said, Where are Ahimaaz and Jonathan? So the woman said to them, They have gone over the water brook. And when they had searched and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. Here we see, again, a Rahab in the intervention of redemption. What did Rahab do? When Joshua was going to besiege Jericho. He went with two spies to see how the situation was in Jericho. They entered into the city. Rahab let them stay in her house and somebody told, they said, they gave the information that those two spies were in Rahab's ha house and she hid them behind some wheat. They did not find them. And that is how this woman named Rahab, we find her in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because she intervened in the plan of redemption. Just like this woman, just like the female servant. So what this shows me, as I see this throughout the Bible, it shows me the beautiful ministry of the woman in the work of redemption. And so, um, I don't want to take too much time in this theme now. One day I'll take all the time, but it is beautiful. It is beautiful to know that the Lord does not uh, make exceptions of people. And the woman has their place in the plan of redemption of the souls of humankind. And we've all been commended to give the good news of the salvation in Jesus Christ and to give the warning of the consequences of death, of sin, which is death. And so we see that this, uh, sh this work shines in the scriptures. And I want you to go with me into the book of Psalm. Like I said, I will not take too much time because we're speaking of the advice of Ahitophel and the advice of Hushai, but we're going to go to the book of Psalms, chapter 68, and we're going to go to verse 11, and it says, The Lord gave the word. There was great, great was the company of those who proclaimed it. And so, um, this verse, and um, you can look in uh, different versions and to clarify this uh, scripture there are other versions and it says in other versions you can look them up yourself and I want to share this with you and it says it says the Lord gave the word 
And the women who proclaim the good news are a great multitude. So, therefore, you can find it in um, other versions of the Bible if you do research. And so, if you look in the different versions, it says the Lord gave the word, and it says the women who announce or who proclaim the good news. It is a great multitude of women. So, we see how beautiful it is, the participation, the intervention of the women in the redemption, in the warning, advising of the warning, of the danger. Um, we see this woman who hid these men who went to go give the information to David. And so we see how this plan of salvation is developed. And the Lord is so beautiful. That's why I love him so much. Because he did not exclude us in his plan of salvation. To proclaim those news of salvation. And so that is just uh, something that you can uh, enjoy. And... Um, you know, just like we enjoy every other part of the word of the Lord, for it is honey, as sweet as the honey from the honeycomb. And so we will go back and read in Second Samuel 17:20, and it says, And when Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house, they said, Where are Ahimaaz and Jonathan? So the woman said to them, They have gone over the water brook. And when they had searched and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. Verse 21. Now it came to pass after they had departed that they came out, out of the well and went and told David, King David, and said to David, Arise and cross over the water quickly. For thus has Ahitophel advised against you. So David and all the people who were with him arose and crossed over the Jordan. By morning light, not one of them was left who had not gone over the Jordan. So we see that David and his people crossed over safely because he followed the advice of Hushai and not the, the evil uh, advice of Ahitophel. And so they were able to receive those news, that warning. And so it was these two gentlemen that gave um, uh, this information to David. Um, because it was given to them by this female servant. So look at everybody who participated in this plan, this plan that God was developing. And he was protecting his servant David because he was to be the model of the kings and he was going to be a model for us as to what is the true Christian life. He was going to be a model for the leadership for everybody who aspires a leadership position. Here is a saving. We see God's saving grace in David's life. Um, and, and also so that from him, his lineage, the Savior of the world would come, Jesus Christ. And so look at all the pieces, all of the vessels that God moves and uses. And that's how his work is. God uses the child. God uses the young person. God uses the women. God uses the men. God uses everyone who allows to be molded for his glory, for the glory of the Lord Jesus. It is beautiful, beloved in Christ. We delight in the word of the Lord. And now, let's see that not a, all of Israel accepted David. Just like uh, Israel, not all of Israel accepted the Lord Jesus. They rejected the Lord Jesus. But there was people, there was disciples, there was a great multitude who served the Lord Jesus. And so the same thing happens here. Not everybody was with Absalom, he became despicable in the eyes of Israel when he took the women of his father David. And so what he uh, wanted to do as a vengeance, uh, it came out wrong for him. It did not please the people. So we're going to continue in verse 23. Now when Ahitophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey and arose and went home to his house, to his city, then he put his household in order 
and hanged himself and died, and he was buried in his father's tomb. We're going to see the end of Ahitophel here. A man of God, because he was a man of God, but with a very tragic ending. Why? Because he kept roots of bitterness in his heart. Those roots grew, and they gave a very bitter fruit. A, warm, a man who was wise, he realized that Hushai was manipulating the pride in Absalom. It was uncovered. He knew this. His gifts were active. Though they were used diabolically, he realized that his power had ended. He had no more influence in the kingdom and much less next to Absalom. So what does he do? He goes in his donkey. He ordered his house. And after, he hangs himself on a rope and he dies hung. A man filled with wisdom, a man filled with gifts, a man who sat at David's table, his faithful advisor in the eyes of David, a man that David loved, a man that gave him many benefits, many privileges, Certainly, David committed adultery when he went with his granddaughter. But Bathsheba's father forgave David. The father of this woman, Bathsheba, continued to be in the group of the valiant men of David. And we're going to see this at the end of this chapter of this book of Samuel. We're going to see how God honors him. God is always going to honor those who have been wounded. God gives us the capacity to forgive. And God is the one who is going to honor. And God is the one who is going to reward and so we see that the suffering, the discipline, the rod, the correction, at the end, at the end, we see the results and the reward that comes from God. We saw the bitter one. We saw the one who cursed David in his bitterness. Nonetheless, David, uh, he bore the cursing. But what he didn't bear was uh, adulation or the sweet words of Sheba who wanted a position. And it's beautiful to understand this. And uh, this is a reality. We've all gone through circumstances that are very painful or have been very painful. But once again, I repeat to you, we have to cut all of those bitter roots in our hearts all of those, des those desires of vengeance. And I'm going to repeat it to everybody. It is not easy. But if we maintain those roots of bitterness in our hearts, they're going to grow. And the fruit is going to be so bitter that it can take us to death. This man realized that his time had come. He could no longer stand against the wisdom that came from heaven against the advice that was going to destroy the diabolical wor works. He could not stand against the advice of Hushai. Remember that love, that prudence, that wise advice, advice that comes from heaven. Love is going to overcome every plan of the devil. And that is what Hushai did here. And so he hangs himself. Um, Ahitophel hangs himself, and this is the first Judas we find. What happened with Judas? Judas got bitter because, according to him, his leader failed him because he had his own plan. Judas was part of a political party, revolutionary. He was from the zealots, 
And as he saw the fame of the Lord Jesus, he said, well, this, the multitudes follow this one and, and uh, it is uh, for our benefit uh, for him to put together a, a strong, powerful army and we can go against Rome. But during the time of the ministry of the Lord Jesus, he heard the teachings and he heard that the Lord Jesus didn't speak about vengeance. He didn't speak about overthrowing the Roman government. He ate with them. Jesus ate with the sinners. He ate with the tax collectors. So Judas is like, what's wrong with this one? He's not matching with my plan. He's not speaking about war. He's speaking about forgiveness. He's speaking about us loving our enemies. And and he, he says, pray for your enemies, but I want to finish my enemies. And that's why I followed him because he would be a, strong, powerful support, the multitudes follow him. And so in the eyes of Judas, his leader failed him because it was not the plan of God to finish the Roman people, the plan of the Lord Jesus, which was the plan of his father, God, was to finish the sin in our hearts. And that is the reason why um, frustrated, bitter, and uh with a feeling of being let down or whatever you want to fill in the blank. All of this let, led for Judas to destroy him, his own self. And so Ahitophel, his plan was good, but it was not according to the will of God. The Lord was taking David by his hand to discipline him, to disciple him, and to correct him. And nobody was going to touch David because the Lord was with David and he was part of the plan of redemption. So many times, brothers and sisters, many times we are disillusioned with our leaders uh, because maybe we think our plans are good and, and uh, maybe our plans are good, like Ahitophel's plan, it was good. David was tired and so Ahitophel was right. But God will always have a better plan. And yes, your plan is good. And it might seem that the plan of your church or your congregation and how they're carrying uh, the ministry and the church and you think that it's not on point, that it's not right. Remember, maybe your advice is on point. But remember, remember this, that the matter of the church and the way it is carried is the Lord's matter. And if you have a better plan, well, submit yourself because... The plan for the people of Jesus Christ is people who honor God and who submit to His will, though the plan might seem that it's not working, that it's stopped. In its time, it will work. It will come to pass. God is working. He knows how to work with His leaders. God is working with the hardness of the heart. David is hurt by everything that's happening, and he went through his Gethsemane. He crossed the River Jordan. And you know, the crossing of the River Jordan is that step of death. And David surrenders himself to the will of God. Jordan speaks to us about death. We're going to cross the Jordan. But in order to cross that Jordan, when did David cross it? When he's weak, when he can't go anymore, when he has no strength left, when he says, Lord, here I am. I die to my own plans. I die to my own will. I die to my own self. I surrender. I cross the Jordan. Now let's look at Absalom now. Hallelujah. Now before we look at Absalom, we, we're going to see him. Uh, we're going to see him next week so we can look at him with luxury of details. And we're going to see all of the supposed victory that awaits Absalom. And we're going to go in uh, chapter 18. But we're going to end with this beautiful note for today. Because if something causes more pain than what he's already gone through to David is Absalom's death.
his fall. He filled himself with pride, showing off of his military power. And next week, if the Lord allows, we will see how Absalom ends. And so, let's look at David on the other side of the Jordan now. And in verse 27, we read, Now it happened when David had come to Mahanaim, that Shobi the son of Nahash, from Rabbah of the people of Ammon, Machir of Emil from Lodebar, and Barzillai, the Gileadite from Rojalim, brought beds and basins, earthen vessels, and wheat, and barley, and flour, parched grain, and beans, lentils, and parched seeds, honey, and curds, sheep, and cheese of the herd. For David and the people were with him to eat. For they said, The people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. So as Absalom is preparing his army, filled with vanity and with pride, and he's planning to go in front of the battle, his sin of pride was about to reach him. Vanity and pride was the fall of Absalom. Let's keep this in mind. Meanwhile, in the verse that we read, David was received at Mahanaim with provision for him and all his men. You know, the people were hungry. They were thirsty. They were tired. They had crossed the desert. These men that were helping were of the people of Israel. But they showed themselves to be as the best warriors, offering what they needed. Here, it was as God himself putting in the heart of David and in the heart of his men and all who were with him oil in their wounds. It is not in vain that David says in Psalm 23, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. As Absalom is preparing to destroy him, to finish with his life, the Lord is preparing and bringing David a banquet, a banquet with everything that they could possibly need to strengthen them, to nourish them, even in the correction and discipline, I repeat to you, and in the midst of the rod of the Lord, He will always show His great favor and mercy. Let's remember, He doesn't want the death of the sinner. He wants us sinners to proceed unto repentance. He always wants for us to come to Him, confessing our sins, so that we will be raised. The prideful one retains their sin and they do not confess. And so let's look at how sad the end of these are. Look at the one who committed treason. He hangs himself. And we'll see Absalom next week. Now discipline takes us to be formed into the image of Christ. Let's not reject the discipline. Let's not reject the advice of God. Because the advice of God makes us wise. The Bible says that the advice of God, the wisdom of God, makes the simple one wise. Now, it is not the worldly wisdom. That wisdom, that worldly wisdom leads us to death. This is not worldly wisdom. The wisdom of God is kind, is love. The wisdom of God is eternal. So let's accept the discipline. It hurts. Oh, yes. But we are being formed. How many of us want to be formed, transformed? I don't want to be deformed in my character. I don't want the deformity in my life. Do you realize that even in the midst of everything that David has gone through, of all the pain, of all his suffering, God prepares a table for him. And that he does with you too. Even in the midst of everything that the Lord allows 
in our lives, no matter how painful it is. That many times we want to throw in the towel. And maybe you have thought, why live? What is the purpose of my life? But when we wait on the Lord as David waited, because he trusted in the Lord, in spite of the suffering and the pain and the humiliation, physical pains, emotional pains, brokenness, he never lost his trust in God. He continued to wait on God. He continued to believe in God. He knew that God had a plan for his life. But I, he never imagined how far the reach of this plan was. Maybe he never thought that his name would be in the sacred pages of the Bible and that God would say of him, a man according to my own heart. How beautiful would it be for us that God would say, they are my servants, a man, a woman, broken, yes, that have gone through testings, trials, tribulation, but I've completed my objective. They were transformed. They waited patiently. They accepted my discipline. They accepted my correction. And now they are men and women according to my heart. Because even in the midst of correction, of the discipline and the rod of the Lord, He's always going to show us His mercy and His faithfulness. Let's remember that He does not want the death of the sinner. He wants us to proceed unto repentance, that we will recognize our failures. The person who is filled with pride is very vulnerable, is vulnerable to the adulation, to the sweet words that lift them up. The prideful heart, Absalom's prideful heart was soon going to be taken to death. David got to taste the sweet, but he also got to taste the bitter. It was sweet when he spent time in the vigils of the night, singing and praising and worshiping God, writing these beautiful psalms who are our comfort in our dark nights. But they are also our hope. We can also see the greatness of God through these psalms because in the midst of the tribulation, of the dark nights, of the bad taste of the things that happen in this world, we can taste the sweetness of the word of the Lord. We can also experiment the sweetness of His love, the consolation, the comfort when He comes near us and He wipes our tears away. There is so much to gain when we accept the discipline of the Lord and there is a lot to lose when the person gets filled with heart and they prefer the sweet words that do not correct. Absalom, he loved the sweet words of adulation. The prideful person is vulnerable to the sweet words spoken to them. And they are manipulated because they accept those people who speak nice to them. And that person who speaks to them with adulation knows their weakness and speaks to them what they want to hear. And they are people that are very weak because through the pride, they are manipulated. And sooner or later, they're going to be destroyed. Ahitophel preferred death. Look at what he preferred. Before being confronted with his sin, I'm finished. My advice is good, but they're following another advice. An advice. Uh, uh, and so they are lifting up and appealing to Absalom's pride. And Ahitophel knew 
because he was wise. He knew that through pride and through the adulation to Absalom, he knew that Hushai was going against Absalom and that he was going to be destroyed. But Ahitophel preferred death rather than being confronted with his sin. What was his sin? Bitterness, pride, just like Judas preferred death and he hung himself. Instead of going to the cross, instead of going to the feet of Christ and saying, Lord, I have failed you, I have committed treason, I have failed you. Instead of recognizing the sin that he had committed of treason, he preferred to hang himself rather than coming to the feet of Christ at the cross of Calvary. Christ was dying for Judas. Christ was dying for all the Judases, all the backstabbers, all those who violate the trust. Christ is, was dying for those who deny him, like Peter denied him. Christ is dying for the liars. He was crying for the abusers. He was dying for us, the sinners. But Judas and Ahitophel preferred to hang themselves. David proved that God had forgave him, though the correction cost it in pain. Yes, beloved, we are forgiven when we confess our sin and separate ourselves from our sin. But together with the forgiveness, we have to wait for the correction so we won't commit that sin again. God continued to be his provider, his high refuge, and he enjoyed of the banquet that God prepared for him in the midst of this test. What a, an amazing banquet with wheat, barley, flour, parched grain and beans and lentils, parched seeds, honey and curds, sheep and cheese of the herd for him to eat, for him and the people to eat in the middle of the desert. God prepares a banquet. The difference between Ahitophel and Absalom. Now David, he admitted his sin, he accepted the correction of God and he accepted. He expects for God to deliver him from all his afflictions. He doesn't complain. We're not going to find complaints from David and all of this difficult process that he went through. He just waits on God. And he himself says it in one of the Psalms. Patiently, I waited on the Lord. And he inclined his ear. And he heard my cry. And he made me come out of the miry pit. And he adds, though I was afflicted and needed, God will think of me, my help. And my deliverer is you, my God. Do not delay. Psalm 40. What did David learn in this process of discipline, of correction, of the rod? He learned to wait on God. And he received four benefits because he waited. And waiting on God is not easy. It is not an easy task at all. But let's look at the benefits of the wait that David made. He took him out of the desperation. Number two, he set his feet upon the rock, upon Christ, the eternal rock. Number three, he straightened up his walk. Do you realize discipline, the rod, correction, discipleship, affliction, what causes us pain, straightens up our walk. And lastly, he put a new song of praise in his mouth. Those are the benefits of waiting patiently on the Lord. Those are the benefits of waiting and accepting the correction from God. Those are the benefits 
that are going to help us so that our heart will be transformed and that we will walk, that our steps will be walked uprightly and righteously. righteously. May God bless you. Now let's hear Psalm 40. Blessings, beloved in Christ. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up from the dreaded pit and out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. A song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear, and they will trust in the Lord. Blessed the man whose trust is the Lord, who turns not to lies or to the proud. Many the wonders you have done, O Lord my God, your thoughts toward us. None could compare if I should tell They're far beyond numbering Far beyond numbering You've not will gifts and sacrifice You have dug for me my years Burning and sin offerings You have not required then I said, Behold, I come, as it is written in the book. I delight in your will, my God, your law is in my heart. Your law is in my heart. I have told the good news of righteousness to the great congregation. Lord, you know I've not held back my lips. Or hidden it in my heart I have spoken of your faithfulness And your salvation I have not concealed your love and truth from them You, O oh Lord, will not withhold Your compassion from me your love and kindness and your truth will always preserve me. Surrounded by evil and my sins, so that I cannot see. Outnumbering the hairs upon my head, my heart has failed me. seek you rejoice and may they be glad in you let all who love your salvation say the Lord be magnified though I am poor and in need the Lord is mindful of me you're my salvation and my help do not delay you my God I have told the good news of righteousness to the great congregation. Lord, you know I've not held back my lips or hidden it in my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your love and 